This month marks the anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Join Richard Ebeline and me in this week's segment of the Libertarian Angle as we discuss what President Franklin Roosevelt did to provoke that attack. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the principled and compromising case for libertarianism, especially in the context of what's going on in the world, the burning issues of the day. I'm joined, as I am every week, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to be with you and our viewers and listeners. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. If you're new to FFF, uh, come and visit us at FFF.org. Subscribe to our FFF Daily Journal of Uncompromising Essays, both originals as, as well as ones we find on the Internet, our monthly journal, Future of Freedom, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. So, okay, Richard, we've got December 7th, uh, the anniversary of the so-called day that will live in infamy, as President Franklin Roosevelt termed the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, the official line is always done every time this anniversary comes up that Japan just initiated out of the clear blue this unprovoked attack on the United States, that, that Roosevelt was just shocked, U.S. officials were shocked, they had no idea that it was coming. And, and of course, it's always billed as a fight for freedom. You know, the, oh, the Japanese, you know, were attacking our freedom and uh, American soldiers died in the Pacific defending our freedom. Well, this is all just a crock. I mean, you know, we've we've written many essays and published many essays over the 30 years that FFF's been in existence, including in, in our book, The Failure of America's Foreign Wars, on the buildup of what happened here. Uh, and, but I think it's worth emphasizing uh, because we get this official tripe every time this anniversary comes around. The fact is that the American people were overwhelmingly opposed to entry into another world war in Europe. They had seen what had happened in World War I. President Wilson had gone into that war with the war aims of making the world safe for democracy, which of course isn't freedom at all, and also the war to end all wars. I mean, what a crock. Uh, and, and the American people realized it was a crock very soon, you know, especially with the rise of Hitler and then the outbreak of war again. And they realized that American soldiers had been sacrificed for nothing in World War I, not to mention the fact that there was massive violations of civil liberties by Wilson. There was conscription. They were forcing American men to go abroad and die for nothing. So Americans wanted nothing to do with it. And of course, the Constitution says... Uh, that only Congress can declare war. So President Roosevelt knew that he could never get a uh, Congress to declare war in World War II. So he, he knew the American people were overwhelmingly opposed to the war. He even played to that in his reelection campaign in 1940, where he said, you know, I'll never send your boys into any foreign wars or your uh, boys will never die in foreign wars. And it was a lie because he was actually doing everything he could to get America into that war. He was, he was subverting America's constitutional system, our democratic system, that says only Congress makes this decision. Well, after trying to provoke the Germans, uh, which didn't work, Germany didn't take the bait, Roosevelt figured, well, I'll go in the Pacific and provoke the Japanese and maybe I can get my back door to war there. So he did everything he could to provoke the Japanese into attacking. He, he froze up Japanese bank accounts, which, of course, was totally illegal since there was no war between the two countries. But more important, he had one of the most effective embargoes in history, an oil embargo. And Japan was getting squeezed. They had their war machine going on in China. They needed the oil. And uh, so Roosevelt finally just cornered them, put them in a position of deciding, well, do we just withdraw from China, or do we let our war machine collapse here for a lack of oil, or do we go into the Dutch East Indies and invade and get oil there? Well, they were so concerned about U.S. interference with that invasion that they decided to try to knock out the U.S. fleet, and that was, that was the whole limited war aim at Pearl Harbor. There was no plan to invade the United States, which would have been ridiculous. They would have never been able to establish the supply lines to maintain that type of endeavor. 
Uh, and uh, of course, it didn't work. The, the wily Roosevelt, who had left the battleships at Pearl as bait, and American soldiers in the Philippines as bait, had been uh, clever enough to remove the carriers. But they had broken the Japanese diplomatic code and possibly even the military code. They knew that war was imminent. And so when the war came, uh, whether Roosevelt knew exactly that that's where it was going to take place, the fact is he was not disappointed. He had gotten what he had wanted. And he had to sacrifice a lot of American men to get that. But that's really the, te the legacy of Pearl Harbor. It's really a president who will live in infamy for intentionally sacrificing American men in the process of subverting America's constitutional order. What do you think? Well, all I can do is sort of reiterate some of the important points that you've made. Uh, shortly after Winston Churchill became prime minister in May of 1940, as the Germans were proceeding to invade the lowlands in France, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill started a secret correspondence uh, in which, uh, as Churchill later said, uh, he was trying to be as polite and courteous and accommodative as possible because it was time necessary to woo the bride into the marriage of war. Uh, Roosevelt himself uh, was an Anglophile, uh, very supportive of the British. And to be honest, he also had this mentality of uh, having tried to give a new deal to the United States uh, what more great adventure could await him, having now been elected to an unprecedented third term in 1940, uh, to giving the world a new deal. Uh, as you were saying, he attempted to uh, uh, bait the Germans. Uh, the U.S. was neutral in the Atlantic. Uh, the British were buying American supplies and war-related material uh, from the United States and bringing them across the Atlantic back to Britain. Uh, in violation of, of the Neutrality Acts that Congress had passed and Roosevelt had signed, uh, he was sending uh, U.S. military uh, vessels uh, halfway across the Atlantic and uh, uh, tracking uh, German U-boats, their submarines, and then informing uh, the British where these U-boats were, so either with uh, sea vessels or when they had a range for, for aerial uh, reconnaissance, for them to locate these U-boats and be able to try to sink them. Uh, the, the U.S. Greer cornered one of these German U-boats, and basically the U-boat finally turned around when it was being dogged, and it was clear that it was being set up for the British, turned around and shot a torpedo uh, that missed the U.S. vessel. But immediately Roosevelt, the next day, went before the press and said, you see, the Germans have initiated war against the United States. But since uh, the, the, the torpedo had missed the USS Greer and no loss of American lives, uh, he, that didn't rise to the necessary occasion to believe that he could get a declaration of war from, from the British. So as you were saying, he also turned to the Pacific. Uh, the fact is, is that as you were saying, his family had had long economic relationships in China, trading relationships in the 19th century. So he was, he was a great uh, supporter and believer in, in China and, and, and a critic of the Japanese. And, uh, and he saw the Japanese as these aggressors, which obviously they were. They invaded China. Uh, they occupied huge swaths of the Chinese mainland. They were brutally cruel. Anyone who knows a little bit of the history, and particularly the rape of Nanking, Nanking along the Yangtze River, uh, about a two, three hour drive up the Yangtze from Shanghai, uh, was the Chinese capital when the Japanese arrived there. They raped, they pillaged. It's estimated that, that in taking this city, they, they killed maybe a quarter of a million people. Women from the age of like eight to over 80 were raped and then murdered. Men were tied to poles and used as live bayonet practice. I mean, they're, they're, the, the Japanese were brutally cruel and insensitive to any life. But the fact is, it was not America's war. America uh, had not been threatened by the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese had been attempting to do everything possible to keep the United States uh, out of the war, even though they knew that uh, the famous Flying Tigers, the American uh, U.S. pilot who went and, quote, volunteered uh, to serve in the Chinese Air Force against the Japanese, were in fact being supported and subsidized by Roosevelt's government. That came out years later. Uh, but the Japanese knew that. Uh, so the finally 
then Roosevelt imposed these these embargoes on oil shipments, uh, on uh, on other war-related uh, uh, war possible material, freezing their accounts. And the Japanese basically were put into a corner of either breaking out of this encirclement embargo financially and economically, or to surrender to U.S. demands. And the U.S. was demanding that they withdraw from all of China. And the implication is that there would be consequences if they continued not to do. An embargo would be driving the Japanese to their economic needs. And uh, the Japanese kept trying to negotiate, but Roosevelt wouldn't. Now, it is, it's very controversial. Did Roosevelt know there was actually going to be an attack on Pearl Harbor? That, that's sort of one revisionist account. But even if you don't believe that, it is clear that, that he, he, he believed that if he could initiate a war in the Pacific, it would ripple over into Europe, which is what he considered the priority. And uh, in, in early December, uh, the Americans had broken the Japanese codes, the diplomatic codes at least. Uh, there are beliefs that they may have broken the military codes. Certainly the British may have bro broken the middle military codes. As, as the Russians were having information, the Soviets, Stalin basically knew where the, where the Japanese were going to attack and practically to the day from one of their leading spies in Tokyo. Uh, and, uh, but we had broken the diplomatic codes and um, December 4th, 5th, 6th, it was clear that the a set of messages were being sent to the Japanese embassy in Washington, DC. And it was all clearly saying that negotiations had reached a climax point. And they were waiting for the last part of the message, which only was, was transmitted uh, very early Washington time uh, 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 on the 6th, uh, when it was then approaching morning in, on the 7th in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. But the, the bottom line is that we broke their, all of their codes and were waiting for the final message. The final message was basically telling the Japanese ambassador with a special envoy who had been sent there to basically announce that there was going to be a declaration of war. Uh, we broke that final message before it actually was translated into readable Japanese uh, at the Japanese embassy. Uh, but, by, but by that time, the attack had occurred because the Japanese only decoded their own message after the attack occurred. But the Americans knew that this was happening. There were all the indications on the 5th and the 6th. What the Roosevelt administration definitely and clearly failed to do uh, with negligence of duty uh, was to inform the U.S. commanders at Pearl Harbor, uh, Admiral Kimmel and General uh, Sharp, short, that, that this was really eminent and that they should put on their extra guard. And they weren't told this. They were made the scapegoats, by the way. Oh, they failed and prop put it properly defending the, the, the Army and Navy and Air Force defense. They, uh, they, they were the ones who caused this disaster. Where, uh, as it's clear that it was all on the shoulders of Roosevelt and those in administration. And, you know, when the war is over, everybody writes their, their, their memoirs and stuff. And a cabinet member, as these, as these parts of this Japanese message were being uh, decoded on November 5th, 6th, uh, one of them said, the, the trick is to get the Japanese to fire the first shot. You got that? To trick the Japanese into firing the first shot. Because that way, the United States and the Roosevelt administration would not be considered guilty for initiating a, a U.S.-Japanese conflict in the Pacific. And then, of course, after that attack, in which almost 3,000 Americans lost their lives, a lot of battleships and other vessels were destroyed through the uh, Japanese aerial attacks, two waves of them early um, in, on Sunday, December 7th. Uh, Roosevelt then goes before Congress on November 8th, uh, excuse me, December 8th, to a joint session of Congress, and uh, 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 th that in a date that will live in infamy, uh, the Japanese Empire has attacked an unprovoked and implicitly innocent America, when in fact the, the Americans had done everything to be prodding the bear with a stick through the cage. Bam, bam, bam. And they initiated the circumstances with this, where this occurred. Now, ultimately, it was the Japanese decision to do this. Okay? They initiated the war. Okay, they were being prodded and poked, but the point is the J Japanese authorities in Tokyo made this decision. They're not, they're not unresponsible merely because of the Roosevelt policies, but the U.S. set up the conditions in which the Japanese were put into 
what they came to view as an untenable position unless they tried to knock out the United States. Uh, and their goal, as you were saying, was never to march on Washington, which was a propaganda thing during the war. No, they believed that they could sink the, the, the fleet in, in Pearl Harbor. And they were hoping for the aircraft carriers, but quote, miraculously, all the aircraft carriers were not in the port that morning. That if they could do that, they were so weakened over an extended period of time, the US military's capacity, particularly naval capacity, to initiate a counterattack, that the Japanese could see, secure the territories they wanted in East Asia. The Dutch East Indies, what we now call Indonesia because of its oil, knocked the British out of Singapore and Malaya, and seized the Philippines because that was an American colony territory at that time, which would be a threat to, to the supply lines between Japan and the rest of Southeast Asia. And that, that they set up a, a strong defensive wall along the Japanese I, uh, the Pacific Islands that the U.N. would have to have a compromise peace, compromise peace. Of course, they, they, they totally misread the Americans, uh, both the Roosevelt administration, to be honest, the patriotic war fervor that was roused among the American people, because the American people believed that we'd been attacked innocently. And, you know, therefore the Japanese need to be taught a lesson. So the Japanese totally miscalculated this. Their failure to, 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 to successfully uh, catch the aircraft carriers in Pearl Harbor and, and the, their misreading of what would be the general public support for Roosevelt in fighting this war. And then if I can just add, so but what about his, his, his idea that Germany was the main threat yet to support the British? Well, a couple of days after the attack on the war on Japan, and then of course, complicated. so Hitler made it easy for Roosevelt then to say, well, we're fighting on two fronts, Europe and Asia, and then to prioritize to support the British in the defeat of, of Hitler first. Yeah, uh, it was actually worse about how they how they supposedly warned Kimmel and Short that they told them that to be prepared for sabotage. And well, if if that's the threat, sabotage, then you put all your planes together in a little bunch so that you can protect them from terrorists and saboteurs that are going to come and try to do damage to the planes. Well, if you're going to prepare for an air attack. You do, you, do, you do it completely different. You spread your planes ac uh, around, you put them up in the air, uh, uh, send them out at various times so that they can all be hit. Well, they told Kimmel and Short, be prepared for sabotage. And so they made them sitting ducks for the Japanese. And then when they got the very last message, uh, the East Wind Rain message uh, that they decoded, and they knew that an attack was imminent from the air, they, they send a message to Kimmel and Short by the slowest possible process. You know, top secret, I forget, through diplomatic channels. No, when, sent by Western Union. Western Union. The, guy, the Western Union messenger arrived by bicycle as the attack is occurring yeah. on the naval base at Pearl Harbor. I mean, if you're really concerned about the imminence of an attack and where American men are going to lose their lives and your battleships are going to be destroyed, you don't worry about niceties of secrecy or anything. You get on the phone and you call them. Get ready. They're coming right now. But the reason they couldn't... I'm sorry? The that, that, was, that, that there seems to be no evidence is that when the Western Union man delivered the message of an imminent attack, did he or did he not receive a tip? I don't know. <laughs> oh, a tip from, you know, a okay. joke. Oh, funny. By the way, there's one other actually factual thing. During the attack, uh, the Japanese planes were obviously not just dropping bombs, but strafing with their, uh, their plane machine guns. A bullet goes right through a main window of the headquarters at Pearl Harbor and hits the chest of Admiral Kimmel, and it bounces off his chest. Because by the time it hit him, it, its force had been spent, right? The velocity had slowed down. It just went, broke through the glass, hit his uniform, and bounced to the ground. I mean, that wow. sounds bizarre. And Kimmel uh, turned to an assistant and says, I wish it had killed me. Huh. That's an odd thing to say. Uh... Well, he knew he was going to get 
the responsibility for this. Well, they did. They were court-martialed, and uh, history finally vindicated them. But uh, but Roosevelt couldn't afford to get on the phone and, and warn them because it if he had publicized the warning and said they're coming, that might have deterred them from carrying out the attack. Right. We couldn't do anything that would jeopardize the Japanese from continuing to initiate the attack. And then he's got... American soldiers in the Philippines. I mean, what in the heck are they doing in the Philippines? I mean, this goes back to the Spanish-American War now. That's an after effect of that, where the U.S. had conquered the Philippines after they were fighting for independence, first against Spain and then finally against the United States in the Spanish-American War. The United States finally defeats them after a massive loss of life, where American soldiers just massacred Filipino soldiers, not to mention tortured the heck out of them. So you end up with this possession. Well, Roosevelt could have gotten those guys out of there. There was no reason to keep those men there. And, of course, he orders MacArthur to leave. MacArthur didn't have to leave. MacArthur could have said, I'm disobeying orders. I'm staying with my men. But, boy, the tragedy of those men that were left there. I mean, the, the Bataan Death March. Uh, I think the guy's name was Wainwright, General Wainwright. Uh, I mean, emaciated when they finally caught up to him. I mean... This was this was Roosevelt's, you know, this is the price that Roosevelt was willing to pay to get into yeah. the war. But by the way, some of those American prisoners that were captured after the fall of the Philippines, the Bataan Death March, Corregidor, some of them, like Wainwright, ended up in Japanese prisoner war camps in Manchuria, where they had uh, uh, experiments done on them the same way the Nazis were doing in their concentration camps, like Dr. Mengele, those type of experiments were done on some Americans. So that's another thing that can be laid at the feet of Roosevelt's administration of not figuring out some way to uh, get those American forces out of the Philippines when it was clear that, that the Japanese were going to overwhelm them. Now that's very interesting because then after the war is over, and you've got the aftermath of World War II, where the communists now control all of Eastern Europe and half of East German, half of Germany, uh, and the CIA is then brought into existence in '47, and they start engaging in ex experimentations on people, and they they give free passes to Nazis that were involved in uh, experimentation, as well as to some of these infamous Japanese units that were involved in experimenting on on human beings. Yeah. Uh, it, it was all part of this dark side aspect of the national security state that World War II brought into existence. Well, the entire issue is that who would have more of the good Nazi scientists, the Soviets or us? So that was yeah. the race. Yes. Yeah. Werner von Braun, who helped build our missile systems, right? He helped build the V-2 rockets in Germany. I once saw him interviewed on the Johnny Carson show obviously a very long time ago, right? And he asked uh, Von Braun, right there on right the, the Tonight Show, uh, had, had, he, had he been a member of the Nazi party? And Von Braun said, yes. And Carson asked him something like, well, well didn't you feel uncomfortable with that? No, that was just like being a Republican or a Democrat. <laughs> oh, and I'm sure that's now, the case. Now, he didn't mean it in the cynical way that I think you and I would interpret that. Uh, he just meant it like it was just the dominant political party, and I'm a German citizen, so you belong to a political party, particularly when it's the in party as opposed to the out party, because there are no out parties. Well, right, and it's that, that same mindset that afflicts so many people in so many countries that you come to the support of your government, right or wrong, in time of war and national crisis, the Great Depression. Hey, let's shift gears a bit. Uh, you wrote another great article on Thanksgiving, uh, and... We didn't really have a chance to discuss that. And so why don't we talk a little bit about the legacy, the heritage of Thanksgiving and the importance that Thanksgiving plays in the principles of free markets and the principles of socialism. Give us a little bit about your synopsis that, that you've really been doing for every year for, gosh, I think 30 years now, because you were cool. writing about this back when we started FFF. So give us a little bit of what your synopsis is. Well, I, I'd like to point out that the, the pertinence of this, when you think of it in the right way, we, have, we are presently going through a strange and peculiar crisis this year. Uh, there is a pandemic, and it's called the coronavirus. Uh, it can have deadly effects on certain demographic 
segments of the population, though it's not quite as serious to uh, younger people. But uh, it is a, a, a serious virus. And, what, and uh, uh, what has been the government's response to this? And by the way, in a way totally different from other virus uh, 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 crises that the U.S. has faced in the past. Uh, they chose what basically was, particularly in the spring and into the summer. And while the federal government did a, did a, a bit of this, uh, particularly the state and local governments, systems of socialist-like command and control, the government now orders you to stop working. The government tells you to stay at home. The government decides the priorities of which industries are, are going to be allowed to continue producing and which will be declared to be in a moratorium until some later period when it's viewed as the crisis has sufficiently passed. That the government tells you not only just to stay home, but tells you what stores you can go to and shop for what particular goods and what times of the day and what range of space you can go out of your out of your own home, whether it be a house or an apartment complex, for walking and exercising. And you are subject to some types of penalty or in principle even arrest if you violated these things. Basically, the U.S. government or some level of a government in the United States, most of this was at the at the state levels, uh, um, because the even Trump, or even it would have been a Democrat, would have really had to violate even more of the Constitution than Trump did to, to, to impose a uniform ruling. on So state governments that did this. You can call it federalist socialism, if you will. But anyway, uh, they basically imposed a planned, controlled economy on the United States. It, was this unique in American history? No, in fact, it wasn't. We once before had a communalist uh, planned economy. And it was when the pilgrims arrived in what we now call Massachusetts in 1620. The pilgrims arrived from, from England, uh, viewing themselves as escaping from religious uh, persecution and prejudice, wanting to establish what they called as a new Jerusalem in America, where they could practice their faith as they want, according to their rather often dogmatic rules. But what they also included in this as part of the Mayflower Compact is that there would be no private enterprise. They would, the colony would be a communal effort. The land would be owned in common, worked in common, shared in common. And all of this is recounted in the diary of Governor Bradford, who was the governor of the, that first colony. And he points out that, that the hope was Plato's ideal in his, in his, in his famous uh, ancient Greek work, The Republic, particularly in the imagery of the warrior class who owned no private possessions, but everything worked in common and shared in common, that you therefore would be other oriented and the selfishness and greed and materialism would pass away. Uh, rather than producing this, the, the, the sort of platonic utopian collectivism, uh, what Bradford relates is that, that that immediately caused antagonisms, conflicts, and, 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 and hardships for the people. Uh, at first, people would go out into the field and be working in common, like a communal farm, okay? The problem was, is that some men and their children, their sons said, no, whether we work hard, whether we show up early, whether we stay later, we're all gonna share common shares in this, right? This egalitarian ideal. So what if I show up late? What if I don't put my shoulder to the grindstone as much? And so on and so forth. So you had people basically goofing off malingering. On the other hand, you had those who had shown an industrious spirit saying, why should I work as hard as I am? Getting up early, leaving late, making sure that the chores have all been done before the end of the day. Well, that bum is going to get an equal share of what I'm producing in far more of a larger proportion of the output. So what Bradford basically says is that it resulted in not only the malingerers being malingering, but that the industrious ones becoming angry, resentful, and upset about this, decided not to be as hardworking and industrious either. So the upshot was is that at the end of the first year, the harvest was meager. A huge portion of the colony ended up dying of starvation. But they persevered in this and tried it again, another season of this, with the unending same consequence. So that at the end of two disastrous harvesting seasons, 
the elders of the colony basically said that if this goes through like this one more year, we will all perish in the wilderness. We have to do something different. So what they decided to do was to divide up the communal property of the colony, the Plymouth colony, into family private farms. And they told each family, this is yours to work. Whatever you produce, you keep. Whatever animals you may raise are yours to do with as you wish. And uh, if you produce any surpluses after harvest time, that is beyond what your own family wishes to consume or use, you're free to trade those surpluses for any surpluses of your neighbors who have grown or uh, crops or raised other animals different than your own for mutual gains from trade, as we would call it today. Now, what does Bradford now relate? Every family was now hardworking. The father and the son would industriously in every farm get up early, be working hard, taking care of the land, raising the animals. Women would, would be taking care of the family chores because before they were done in a communal way too, which caused a lot of anger and resentment among the wives. And so at the end of now, this uh, approaching the harvest time of this third year, rather than famine, they have a feast, bountiful crops, more than enough for each family, the sharing through trade of, of mutual surpluses for, for, for betterment of all. And so they decided to give a thanks to God in the wilderness. And so much so they could invite some of the neighboring Indian tribes in the surrounding forest to join them in this. So as I like to say, when you were around the Thanksgiving dinner table and uh, you were passing uh, around the turkey, the, the, the cranberry sauce, the yams, the, the stuffing and so on, raising a glass to the cheer of a family meal, you should all remember that what you are really celebrating in terms of the real history of the Plymouth colony and the first Thanksgiving is what you were really celebrating was the proof of the failure of socialism and the birth of free enterprise in America. That was the discovery that individuals will work hard and have incentives to be innovative and industrious when they are allowed to reap the honest rewards of their efforts. And that is what made America great by following that principle of private property, freedom of decision-making and choice, and the right of trade for mutual benefit. That is how America began after the failure of that first communist experiment. And that is what could be ours if we don't fall into the trap of some variation on the socialist theme again. Well, I'd say we fell into that trap a long time ago with the welfare state. I mean, that's the whole concept. But instead of everybody puts their private property into collective hands. They, they put their, the fruits of their earnings into the collective hands through the national income tax and, and redistribute it through the welfare state. But it's amazing to me, Richard, that so many socialists around the world and people on the left and, and also conservatives just do not understand this lesson. I mean, you still see it in places like, in extreme cases like Cuba and Venezuela and Korea, North Korea where, I mean, they, they, they nationalize everything, the government owns everything, everybody works for the state, and everybody's starving to death. And they blame it on famines or the weather or whatever, when it's really their system. And, and your point about that, that America better be careful because they're mo we're moving in that direction. Well, I say we've been moving in that direction for 100 years now with, with the Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt re revolution. Uh, starting with Social Security and then moving through Johnson, Medicare and Medicaid and the gigantic me uh, welfare state now, uh, along with all the foreign aid and, and it's bankrupting America. And then it's interesting that you begin with the pandemic because then you've got all that stimulus money. I mean, national debt, the federal government's debt soaring. Uh, so th this is not going to end well, but it's really just a variation of what went on there at uh, with the pilgrims, as you outlined. So really, what I think what we need in America is just a rebirth of freedom where people rediscover this thing and saying, enough's enough. We want the restoration of America's founding principles of free enterprise and genuine limited government as compared to the all these wars and the national security state that we that affect our nation now. Yeah, but what, what has to be overcome is falling for this nonsense that is constantly coming from uh, the left that, oh, you can't judge their ideal of socialism or, or an extensive welfare state by anything that was done in the Soviet Union or in communist Cuba or communist Venezuela or communist Nicaragua or communist North Korea or, 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 or. That was, that was not the right socialism. 
the wrong person got in charge. If, if only they had done it a little bit differently, more democratically. And, and, and this is the line that, they, that, that, that if only we, uh, we get in, we'll do it right. Now, uh, for an instance, uh, this week I wrote an uh, article, uh, my weekly article, on why Hayek was right that, that Nazis were socialists. Because someone brought this up recently in a Washington Post op-ed, uh, oh, the, the, the right, which of course is a convoluted phrase itself, but given the lexicon of how people talk about these things, the right constantly is trying to say that, that Hitler and the Nazis were socialists when, when they weren't. Because why were they not? Because, because they weren't trying to have an extensive welfare state to make life better for people. They were racists. Well, the fact is, is that the house of collectivism has had many socialist mansions in it in history. And you can go through the litmus test. And the fact is, is that the Nazis, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, was just another variation on the socialist theme that led to horrendous disaster for not just the Germans, but for most of Europe. The fact is, is that whenever you allow government to take control of people's lives by controlling the economy, whether they nationalize it or command everyone who nominally remains a private owner to obey the government's dictates, it is centralized planning where the government reduces everyone to a cog in, in the state of the machine and your life is at the mercy and the dependency of those who not only dis determine the distribution of what, the, what share of the output will go to you, but if you get out of line in any way, shape, or form, your life can be made disastrous, including your life being taken away. These are not anomalies. This is collectivism and socialism. And we must realize that if this is attempted even more than presently, in the United States, it leads only to one disastrous dead end. On that excellent <laughs> note, insightful note, we'll wrap it up, Richard. Uh, we're out of time. Again, if you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org. We've got 30 years worth of articles, videos, presentations on the principal case for liberty. This is uh, also our end of year fundraising time. Y'all have kept us going for 30 years now, and Richard can attest to that because he was with FFF 30 years ago when we got started. And uh, we're very, very grateful for the great help y'all have given us. We need your help again for another year. Uh, so we hope you pull out your checkbook or go online and make a donation with a credit card. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate your assistance, and thank you for everything for what you've done for us up to this point. Uh, Richard, on that note, we'll wrap things up and uh, we'll see you all next, next week. Until next time.